Okay, Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 1, it begins the statement for the chapter, Judge Not. Um, that This is not meaning you can never judge, but he's going to make it clear to you how to judge and who you should be judging. Uh, he begins uh, chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged. Well, you're going to be judged regardless. <laughs> you could go through life and never judge anything, and once you die, it's appointed unto a man once to die. And after this, what? The judgment. You're going to be judged. So he's not saying, if you never judge anything, I won't judge you. He's saying, be careful how you do judge. Verse 2. For with what judgment you judge. So he's taking for granted that there, there is going to be some judgment. Ye shall be judged. So it's impossible <clears throat> to not judge. What's meant here is... You have to be careful of the method used for judging. It's either righteous or it's evil. You either use righteous judgment or wicked judgment. Um, in Deuteronomy 25.1, this is the Old Testament system. Deuteronomy 25.1. He says, if there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them. There's a whole bunch of judging going on in there. <laughs> So the system God set up in the Old Testament from the beginning is based on there's going to be judging. He wouldn't have written a book full of rules if he did not intend for some judgment. Mm -hmm. So he says um, that they may judge, that the, that the judges may judge them. Then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. So that's the important thing in judging is to get it right. <laughs> so it's got to be done according to God's judgment. And God wrote the Old Testament for the Jew to understand what was right and what was wrong. For instance, in the Old Testament, you find a, a young kid is killed for picking up sticks on the Sabbath because he broke the Sabbath. Not because it made any sense to humanity, but because it was righteous judgment according to the law. So there's a, there's, a higher, um, there's a higher appeal to judgment than man's rationale. John 7, 24, he says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So there is something called righteous judgment, and he says you're to use it. Okay, we covered all of that uh, last week, and this is where we'll... We'll just cover one verse tonight, verse 6. He says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearl, pearls before swine. Why? Lest they trample them underfoot, and turn again and rend you. Okay, so this is a command he's giving now on, um, on how you should judge. He says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Well, if you're making the call on who's a dog, you've made a, a judgment call. So it's not a matter of we can't decide who's good and who's bad and what's right and what's wrong. No, you should. Because there he's saying, don't give pearls to the swine. Don't give something holy to dogs. The context of this... Um, sermon or this point he's making is in this chapter it's uh, verse 15 to verse 23 we're going to notice he gives us some um, examples uh, pearls and dogs uh, swine and holy things and so we'll trace down all of those elements in verse 15 to 23, this is the body of his message. He says, beware of false prophets. Okay, we're going to learn the false prophets are dogs. That's how the Bible defines them. Which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves, as in a canine. Verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, nor figs of thistles? So there you're already supposed to use rationale. You're supposed to be judging based on 
uh, evidence. What do you see? Okay, what must that be? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Um, it's not bad fruit, it's evil. It's either righteous or evil. Uh, there's no middle ground with God. It's good or it's bad. <laughs> a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Okay, here he's likening people to trees. You'll find this all throughout the Bible where trees represent humans. This doctrinally does not apply to the church age because we're given the exception to every other dispensation. We're given eternal security. Once you're saved, you're placed in Christ Jesus. You're given the sealing of the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to worry about losing it. Every other dispensation, they had to worry about losing it. Um, you would find in the Old Testament that the Spirit would come on them and leave. Saul is the prime example. You see it coming on and leaving, coming on and leaving. Um, he says here that if it's an evil tree, we're going to chop it down and put it in the fire. So there they could lose salvation. So doctrinally, that's not talking about the church age. However, we'll pick up some principles from it. Verse 20, Wherefore, by the fruit ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now he's giving you a clue there. Kingdom of heaven. That's physical. That's the millennium. That's the physical kingdom that Israel will be ruling. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Uh, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Well, that seems like a good thing. And in thy name cast out devils. Surely that's a good thing. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Well, those are all good things. So you can't judge um, righteous and evil based on um, spiritual works. So uh, just having a, 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 a spiritual appearance of success does not mean God considers it success. Verse 23, And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So he said, look, if you were wicked to begin with, even though you produce righteous works, you're still wicked. He says, ye that work iniquity. He said the prophesying and casting out devils and doing many wonderful works, he said those are iniquity. It's based on um, who you are. Now, once we're in Christ Jesus, we don't have to worry about that, but he's not talking to church age anyway, he's talking to the Jew. Um, let's pick up some of the details from verse six. He says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearl before swine, lest they trample them under feet and turn again and rend you. <clears throat> so he says, um, there's some good things and there's some bad things. Let's group things that are alike and the things that are, that are different and see if we can define these terms. Yeah, so the OCD with how he likes to categorize everything. Yes. <clears throat> the good stuff in this is that which is holy and pearls. The stuff that is bad, negative connotation in that verse, is dogs and swine. And we'll start um, finding out what those things mean. So that which is holy. That which holy is holy means two things. And I'll show you what both of these are. It means something that God created and, saint and is sanctified by God for his use. Uh, I'll... Just go through these fast. You won't have time to look them up, but you can look them up later. Exodus 3, verse 5, he says, For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. He said that ground right there is holy. Okay, so it can be a physical object on this earth that God created specifically for his use. In Exodus 12, 16, he says a holy convocation. A convocation is just a a gathering of people 
we would call it a, a congregation. So he said, look, there are certain things I consider holy. And when you do this meeting together on a specific day, specific place, and it wasn't just a specific day, it was sometimes a specific week. For a whole week they would have a convocation. Um, that's why people that are Seventh-day Adventists have trouble because not only was there a, uh, a meeting on the Sabbath, there was also a meeting on Sunday as well, the first day of the week and the sixth day. So you can't, they just started the week on the first day and that was the first holy convocation. They also did it on the Sabbath and that's how they ended the week. Um, and then there was sometimes that he would say there's a Sabbath of weeks. So every seventh week was considered a week Sabbath. And then there's a Sabbath of years. Every seventh year, the land couldn't be worked because that was a Sabbath. It was God's land, and they're letting him do what he wants to with it. He says, it's holy, it's mine. This is how you use it. Uh, in Exodus 19.6, he says, and ye, sh and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. God created the nation of Israel. You'll find when the patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they all have sons, and you'll see God going through and saying, okay, I'm going to pick that one, I'm not going to take that one. I'm going to pick this one, I'm not going to take that one. They're all blood-related, but he says, nope, one's a Jew and one ain't. God created the nation of Israel. So it's his nation. He calls it a holy nation. In Exodus 22, 31, he says, And ye shall be holy men unto me. Now that's a specific group that he says, Of this nation I've created, I've separated these men right here to be holy just for my, just for my use. I will use them as I see fit. In Ezekiel 22, 8, he says, Thou uh, hast despised mine holy things. So there's a whole category called holy things and has profaned my Sabbaths. So there's a whole grouping that you can find in the Bible of things that God has considered holy that he created that are specifically for his use. In 1 Corinthians 3.17 it says, For the temple of God is holy. Okay, that'd be one of those things, the temple. Okay, that was created by God. He gave specific instructions on how it was to be set up, what building materials to use. That was his creation. Okay, he set it up and it's for his use. So that's holy. But here in the New Testament, he goes one step farther. He says, which temple ye are. So now when you're saved, you, your body is that temple. Uh, in John 14, 26, he says, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Okay, what's he going to teach? Things, just like there's holy things, a category of holy things. Here's what, in the New Testament, the things are for us. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said. So it's God's word. For us in this age, God's word are the holy things unto you. In 1 Corinthians seven fourteen, it says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. What in the world is he talking about there? He's saying that God is the only one that can ordain a marriage. Two unsaved people cannot marry. They've just pretended. God is the man who God is the one who joins a man and woman in marriage. It says what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Well, God is not in any part of a heathen marriage. So God didn't join that together. Here he's saying, if you're if you were unsaved, when you got married, you didn't really get married in God's eyes. So you might have children, and you know what? Those children are illegitimate as far as God's concerned because he didn't marry you. 
Here he's saying, if you were unsaved when you got married and then maybe one of the husband or the wife gets saved, he says, I'm going to go ahead and consider as though you had both been saved when you got married. That way your children are not considered illegitimate. They're holy, meaning God created. Um, and then, of course, you, you find this repeatedly called the holy mountain. Um, and that'll be in uh, 2 Peter 1.18 and Ezekiel 20, verse 4. Um, that's both a physical and a spiritual mountain that God says is holy. Now there's two sides to this holy business. We see God is the one who does the work to create something. Once he creates it, he says it's holy. You find in creation, he created, says it's good, and then separates it. Is that, this is the way I'm going to use it. Um, we didn't have any inter interaction in God creating us. When he decided to make you a new creature, you didn't have any part of that. <laughs> you were just yielded. Okay, whatever you want, I'm good with. And then he did the creating. There is a part we do have, and I'll show it to you. Something can be considered holy that is dedicated to God for his service. So the Old Testament, you could take something that was not necessarily holy, dedicate it to God, and now it's holy because it's been given to God for his use. Leviticus 5.15, it says, If a soul commit trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord. Okay, so if you've committed some things to the Lord, and now this guy comes along and commits a trespass, that is, he, he um, used it illegally, um, like an instrument of the, the temple. You'll find Uzzah touches the ark when it's being moved, and that's doing something, he's touched something holy and didn't realize he was not allowed to, but it, you're still held accountable to it. Um, so all of the temple uh, utensils were man-made. They put gold coverings on this and God had ordained how you make everything, but all of that had been made by man but dedicated back to God. In Leviticus 22, 2, he says, Speak unto Aaron to his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they profane not my holy name in those things which they hallow unto me. I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron's job were to dedicate things to the Lord. What happened? you would come in with a animal. Well, that animal in and of itself is not holy. But when you, when you perform the sacrifice, you're giving it back to God. Now it's been donated to a person who's holy. It is holy. <laughs> Leviticus uh, 22, 3, he says, Say unto them, Whosoever he be, of all your seed, among all your generations, that goeth unto the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow unto the Lord. Okay, so the children of Israel were doing just that. They were giving things in the temple to the Lord. Their grain, whatever they were bringing in. There's free will offerings. There's things they're giving. Um, now, a bad example of it is Aaron saying, um, okay, you understand the way the system is set up. Um, God wants gold coverings for everything. That's why he told them when they left Egypt, go borrow everything you need. And they said they spoiled the Egyptians. Not meaning they gave them anything. It means they took everything from them. <laughs> so Aaron comes up and he says, okay, that works for God. Let's use it for the devil. Well, that's a bad way to do it. But it shows you the mindset they had been accustomed to because they saw how God required things. So what did Moses do or Aaron do? He says, break off your gold earrings and bring them to me. That's what the people were doing, was dedicating their gold to the devil. Um, but they had already been accustomed to doing that for God, dedicating something human to God and made it holy. In uh, Numbers 5, 9, he says, And every offering uh, of all the holy things of the children of Israel, which they bring unto the priest, shall be his. 
I was talking about the free will offering or the mandated offerings that the children of Israel would bring. He says, once they've dedicated it, it's holy because it's been given to me. Um, there's an interesting verse in Leviticus 22, 6. He says, the soul which touches any such uh, shall be unclean unto even, even and shall not eat of the holy things lest he die. This is talking about the Levites. All of the Levites had different positions and different jobs. But you'll notice they all get to eat. <laughs> that was nice. They all, <laughs> they all have a, um, a free um, food line. And he says there even, um, even the women are allowed to eat of this food. But he says there's certain rules that go with it when you can eat, when you can't eat. He says, these people, if you touch anything unclean, don't come in and partake of this food that's been offered. Why? Because the food is now holy. It's been dedicated to God. You're bit, it's okay for you to eat of it if you're clean. So the principle behind that is this. A charitable donation should only be given to a person that's clean. They, if we take up money, if you give money to a church as in giving it to God's service, you've just made it holy. Now we can't turn around and give it to someone who's unclean. So you need to prove them. Um, I just thought that was interesting. In uh, Numbers 18.32 he says, Neither shall ye pollute the holy things of the children of Israel. So the children of Israel had things once they dedicated it to uh, the, the temple, or to God, then God considered it holy. In uh, 2 Chronicles 31, 6, he says, Holy things which were consecrated unto the Lord their God. So a thing, an object, can become holy by dedicating it to God. Now that's interesting. Because we don't have any part of salvation. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. He created you. So he gave you his holiness. Said he became sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he made you holy because that's how he makes things. Um, but you can dedicate yourself back to God. That's why he says in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. Why is it holy? Because you've just dedicated yourself back to God. Now, there is no such thing as a second filling of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the charismatics go crazy on this. Um, right, right just like that was Romans 1. Um, that's Romans 12.1. Yeah, um, Romans 12.1 is talked about present yourself a living sacrifice. And then he immediately says that sacrifice now is holy because you presented yourself to God. Um, the charismatics will tell you that you need a, a second filling or initial evidence of the Holy Ghost. What that is... There is baloney is what it is. <laughs> but there is something similar to that, and I can understand where they're getting this from. You can't get any more of the Holy Ghost than God puts in you to begin with. He gives you all of it. Now, how much you yield your body to it is dependent on you. And that can vary from day to day. So there should be a second yielding and a continual yielding to the Holy Ghost every day. That should be um, a continual process that you're yielding yourself over to the Holy Ghost, to God. As you do that, you'll notice times in your life where you're more useful to God. You're talking about the initial yielding is accepting Christ as Savior. When Correct. You first get your Holy when you, Spirit. Right. When you first get the Holy Spirit, it's because you've yielded yourself. I'm, I have no way to do anything, God. You do it. And then the second yielding is when you decide to live for him. Right. When, yeah, but um, the, the first one is um, 
you did nothing and God put the Holy Spirit in you. Right. Now it's time for you to do something and that something has to be repeated over and over and over and over and that's yielding your members servants of his to obey. That yielding um, can be done a second time and sometimes some people um, are so dedicated that they can do that. You know, you'll, you'll find the old timers, probably before there was all this TV and stuff that messed up our minds, <clears throat> they dedicate, when they rededicated their life or when they um, dedicated themselves to be God's servant, you'll see their life do a 360 and never turn back. Um, but that, that doesn't happen a whole lot these days. These days it's more of a daily thing. You have to yield every day, hourly. In 1 Corinthians 6 20, he says, You are bought with a price. You didn't have anything to do with that. You were just bought. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You do have a say in that. You could be bought by Christ and not uh, bring him any glory. Okay, so he's saying there is a side of this equation you can participate in. And that's where a lot of charismatics, I think, get the concept of the, the second filling of the Holy Ghost. It's not really um, a filling of the Holy Ghost, and they do have some, something correct there. There is more to it than just getting saved and now, la-di-da, we got everything we need. No, there, there's a part you participate in. Romans uh, 12, well, we already covered that, 12 one is uh, presenting yourself. That makes it holy holy offering so in, in Matthew 7 6 he says give not that which is holy we define the word holy it's either something created by God and sanctified for his use or it's something dedicated to God for his service so we know that much of the verse so far let's look at it again um, 7 6 Matthew 7 6 give not that which is holy unto the dogs neither cast ye your pearls before swine okay so pearls is another positive thing so let's find out what pearls are we'll find that pearls are feminine um, pearls are feminine and right men don't care about wearing a bunch of pearls um, <laughs> I'm not looking for pearls. Well, you know, I, don't know that, I don't know that those are men. Right. <laughs> it's a God-made substance. It's not a man-made thing. That's a God-made. And it's precious. Precious stones. Right. Um, now, man uh, tries to mimic what God has done. We do cultured pearls, and um, you know we can, we can fake it pretty good. But a real pearl is something God creates. It's not something man does. No, because they still have to put dirt in there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In Exodus 28, 21, it says, And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of the signet. Everyone with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. He's talking about the stones that are on the ephod. Now, all of those stones had a name on it for the tribes of Israel. Now, that sounds masculine, doesn't it? But it's not. Because Israel is the bride of God. God the Father. That was in Exodus 28, 21. We're talking about the pearls, the, the positive part of the last positive thing in this verse. <laughs> Um, the precious stones in Proverbs 11:22, it says as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout so is a fair woman without discretion now there's a whole lot every verse in Proverbs is chock full <laughs> but this one is especially good because it relates to our Matthew passage real well Proverbs 11, 22 says, as a jewel of gold. Okay, gold is something God creates. God makes gold. 
We find it. <laughs> uh, in a swine's snout. Okay, well, we've got a, a, a pig in our passage. <laughs> so, he's, he's giving you an allegory, um, what do you call it? He's, he's giving you two things that compare, and you just match the things that match. Okay, what's the, the gold in that passage? What's the correlation of gold? Woman. As The woman. No. No. Fair. Discretion. Really? Yes. The gold does not become bad. Gold stays the same substance, whether it's in a king's hand or a pig's mouth. The gold is still gold. Mm -hmm. How do you say that it's discretion? Because that's what the verse said. See the verse? It's, a, it's an um, analogy. Analogy. Right. So let's, let's complete the analogy. As gold, uh, as jewels of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman without discretion. Okay? So the discretion, discretion is good. But you put it in a swine's snout, it's bad. So here's a woman without discretion. Discretion comes from God. From his word, you learn to be discreet. Um, and so that's something that, that he's saying there's a correlation that doesn't match. And notice how it's got the, the swine there is a woman. <laughs> Toby has a little saying that she uses from time to time. She says, um, men are dogs. No, you say it wrong. You, know, um, you say men are pigs? There, yeah, there was a lesson I taught a couple of years back where I said that the title could have been Men Are Pigs. Oh, well, actually, we'll find it, that's wrong. Men are dogs, according to the Bible. And women are pigs, according to the Bible. When, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, the swine is a, a feminine gender. Uh, in the Bible. Um, so that fair woman is referred back to the swine. In Proverbs 31.10 it says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above ru rubies? There's that precious stone that uh, God made um, material. He says that it's uh, a virtuous woman. It's female. That's Proverbs 31.10. Malachi 3.17, he says, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. He's talking about the nation of Israel, people of Israel that um, will, will think of him. Uh, in Matthew 13.46, he says, Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it, meaning the field. Okay, so the, that's talking about the church, the church age, the, the bride of Christ. He's called us a pearl. Uh, in Revelation, it shows up again, Revelation 21, 12. Talking about um, New Jerusalem, Revelation 21, 12. And had a great... Uh, and had a wall great and high and had twelve gates and at the gates twelve angels and names written thereon which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel okay uh, look down at verse 21 here's these gates and the twelve gates were twelve pearls every several gate was of one pearl and the uh, the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass so there he's, he's equating Israel the nation each tribe as its own pearl um, so that was something created by God it's feminine because uh, Israel is the the nation as a whole is called the bride of God God's bride that's why in the book of Hosea he says he divorces her 
We, church age, are the bride of Christ. We're family. I heard something today, and I looked it up, and I, would, I had never heard this before in Hebrews until today. It's Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. It says, Christ, but Christ has a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And it just dawned on me, God's bride wife was Israel, and Christ has his own house, and it's us. And that, that was so cool. I mean, I read that Christ has a son over his own house. And yeah, so now, was, the... Um, whose house we are. Yeah, but he's talking to Jews. Oh, yeah. The book of Hebrews. It's written to Hebrews. The book of Jews, uh, the, the book of Hebrews is a Jewish focus. Now, we can pull out principles and learn things from it, just like we can anywhere in the Bible. But doctrinally, when you start applying this means this and it means this, you have to put it back where it belongs to Hebrews. We're not Hebrews. Um, this book is written to take you into the tribulation. This will be a heavily studied book by the Jews who will get saved in the tribulation because they'll learn about their Messiah. Mm -hmm. It says something about holding to the end. That is like always in Revelation. They keep bringing that up to him that overcome it. So it's not like technically Christ, but we are Christ. Christ. I mean, we would write it Christ. We are not. I apply that part of it. Yeah, I know I'll, I'll cover that in detail after. This. Yeah, I'll cover that one verse after this because it'll, it'll take more time than, <laughs> than I've got time to finish this too. Uh, now, no, notice the math in this. This is really interesting. Okay. This was in Revelation 12, uh, sorry, Revelation 21, verse 12. Those are the reverse of each other. Mm -hmm. 21 and 12. Why? Because 12 is a Jewish um, significant number. There's 12 tribes. That represents Israel. Um, and then where he talks about the pearl again shows up in verse 21. So you've got 21, 21. But you reverse those as 12, 12. It's, and it's talking about 12 pearls. So... Um, now, Toby defines the number 21 as a fulfilled promise, which is good. That's too high of math for me. I can't handle. 21 <laughs> is a fulfilled promise? Uh-huh. Okay. That works here. Because 21 is when Israel is finally completely paid up. The tribulation is designed for the purpose of Israel receiving the punishment they deserve once it's complete then god says now all israel is saved so that's he's promised them the earth he's promised them all of these things they don't get it until the end of the tribulation good um, i wanted to give the reference for why 21 is a promise fulfilled and you're talking about the jews mm -hmm. and they started with abraham isaac jacob um, Genesis 21, 1 and 2 talks about um, Sarah conceiving and bearing Isaac. And that was the promised child yep. to Abraham and Sarah. Yep. For me, I simplify it another way. You, you have to find out how God talks to you. <laughs> now, never can you come up with a theory that contradicts what God says in plain English. So don't turn math into some mystical message that's not on the page. But, but once the page matches what the numbers are saying and you see it repeated over and over in the Bible, you can say, okay, that's what it means. You'll find that 21 pop up many times. Not just there, many times. And now you'll start noticing it as you go through. For me, I say it means 21 is 3 times 7. 3 is God's signature. 7 is completion. The 70th week of Daniel will have been completed, signed by God. Um, okay, we could stay there all night. Let's move on. <laughs> Matthew 7, 6 again. Now we're going to get into the negative 
words he uses in this verse. He says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. So what are these dogs? Men. Men. That's right. It is male. You go on. It's male. It means uh, someone unsaved or a heathen. Um, now, this comes up so often in the Bible. I, in the notes, I'll list probably 40 verses where you can find this. But I'll just give you a, a handful of them so you can see what I'm talking about. In Exodus 11:7, he says, But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. So he's made the dog male. First time it shows up. In Deuteronomy 23:18, he says, Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, that's female, or the price of a dog, there's your male, into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. In Judges 7, 5, he says, So he brought down the people into the water. This is Gideon. Um, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. It's all male, 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 male. Now, I know he's talking about the, the human doing the lapping, but he's correlated it to the dog as the male. Um, likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. So, he could have used, doesn't a pig do the same thing? Lap water? So, he didn't say as a pig. He said as a dog. He chose it for a reason. These were all fighting men. No women present. All the pigs we ever had just shoved their faces down in the water and blew bubbles and blew bubbles. Mm -hmm. But that's, that, yeah, that's how they're getting it in their mouth, though, is their tongue. They're, they're pulling it in. In 1 Samuel 17, 43, this is uh, Goliath. And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog? Well, yes, he was. He was, <laughs> he was a big dog. <laughs> he was um, male. Uh, that thou comest to me with um, with staves, and the Philistine cursed God by his gods, or cursed David by his gods. So it's all all masculine. I'll leave. Um, there's so many here that um, you just see it repeated. You wouldn't realize there's so many mentions of a dog in the Bible, but the dog Bible's full of dogs. <laughs> Man's best friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, in Proverbs twenty six eleven, it says, "As a dog returneth to his vomit, so is a fool to his folly." Made it masculine. So the dog is is a male gender. You find it again in Philippians 3, 2. He says, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Now he's identified it. The dog is a masculine evil worker. So that's a male false prophet, false teacher. Beware of the concision. That is, people who were trying to put them back under the Old Testament system of circumcision. In 2 Peter 2.22, it says, uh, but, is, but it is happened unto them according to the proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. Now look at here. And the sow, that's a pig, that was washed to, who's her, wallowing in the mire. See, he didn't use a male gender again when he talked about the, the pig. He said the pig is female. The dog is male. In, um, when he's talking about hell, in Revelation twenty two fifteen, he says, For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers. A whoremonger is a male. A whore is female. A whoremonger is a male. 
and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. In that list is dogs. It's masculine. Um, now I want to show you something that's a little off topic but it's got the dog in it. Jeremiah 15. We'll turn there. Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15. This is God um, talking about what he's going to do to Israel because they've um, gone astray. Um, verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be for, uh, toward this people. <coughs> Cast them out of my sight. Let them go forth. Okay, so God is done with them, with Israel as a nation. Drop down to verse 3. And I will appoint over them four kinds. So there's four things that's going to happen to the nation of Israel. Um, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls of heaven, and the beast of the earth to devour and destroy. Now, we could make a whole lesson out of this verse, but we're not going to. I'm just going to give you the, the cliff notes of it, and you can play with it. The, um, the sword, you know what the sword is. The sword of the Lord. Um, the, the Word of God. He says, when I get ready to take care of Israel and punish them, I'm going to use my sword, His Word. And that's exactly what punishes them. Jesus Christ came to earth, and His words turned them away the more he spake the worse they didn't want to have anything to do with him so he uses the sword first the second thing he promised to use was dogs what do the dogs do in that verse to tear mm -hmm. okay dogs are false teachers that's what israel was full of and still is they've made up their own rules the Tanakh. Um, no, the Talmud. The Talmud is um, the sayings of the rabbis. It's a 36 volume set of books that is not Bible. It's what they've decided they're going to make rules. Kind of like what the Catholics do with the Council of Nicaea, or is it Nicaea? They've had lots of them. Yeah. yeah. Vatican II. And yeah. Right. Yeah, the, um, they add to it. So what did they do? They tear. They tear bits and pieces of God's word apart. And that's stage two. Um, and those were the dogs, false teachers. And the way they teach falsely is they tear up God's word. They make it say what it doesn't say. They add something in there that it didn't say. The third thing is fowls. Those are birds. Those are, if you study your Bible, you'll find the fowls in the Bible represent evil spirits. Um, that's satanic. Um, the fowls of heaven. Okay, that's uh, spiritual wickedness. And that's exactly what has happened to Israel as a nation religiously. You either accept. It sounds like the world. Oh, it can happen to any individuals as well. Mm -hmm. This is the way God punishes. That's why He mentions that He gives four chances for a man to repent. He's that's the misunderstood uh, passage that says um, visiting the sin and iniquity of the children of the father to the children of uh, the third and fourth generation the reason for that is it's four times he gives those children to repent not that I'm going to destroy them no he says I'm going to give them a way out 
in every one of those cases, there's a chance to repent. It's long-suffering. The last uh, thing that happened in Jeremiah 15.3 is the beasts. Well, that's what Revelation is. The beast. What, what do they take on the, the 666? It's called what? The mark of the beast. That will be um, their final destruction. That's step four. Um, but I, I just wanted to show you the dogs in there. The dogs is step two, and that's false teachers. And that's who he's saying you have to be aware of. Mm -hmm. You have to be aware of them. Um, those are male false teachers. We'll find the female false teachers next. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Yep. Sure, it's male and female. Uh, but if it was a male false teacher, it's a dog. If it's a female false teacher, it's a swine, it's a pig. Matthew 7, 6 again. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. The female, we're going to notice something interesting on this one. The first time it shows up, this swine, is uh, Leviticus 11, verse 7. The swine is a female actor. Sometimes she's clean, and then she's right back to the mud. That's her notable characteristic. You can't tell. You might look at her and think, hey, that pig is clean. Just give it a day or two. <laughs> give her the opportunity. Is this an actor? Yes, an actor. So there's a quality of deceit. Yes. What, what was that in Leviticus? Leviticus 11, verse 7. Now watch this carefully. Remember how we defined the dog was the first time it came up, it was referred to as a male gender. Watch what this one does. Leviticus 11, verse 7. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. So the first time it shows up, it's a male. Let's look at the next time it shows up. Okay, you're Yeah, you've got to get all the information first. <laughs> This is why it's an actor. It can be either. Doesn't know what it is. It's transgender. It's an idiot. Yep. Deuteronomy fourteen eight. They sent you something. When it's that. when it's a dog, it is consistent. It always refers to it as a masculine. This swine, it can be referred to as either. And the swine, because. It divideth the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud. It is unclean to you. Ye shall not eat, the, uh, eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. So he repeats what he said in Leviticus, but he changes it from a he to an it. It's an actor. You don't know. Just like you see it one minute and it's clean, and you think, okay, great, I can bring that in as a house pet. Well, you hope it doesn't rain the next day. <laughs> Look at James chapter 1. James 1.18 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's the, the swine there, is unstable. One minute it's clean, the next minute it's not. Just like the gender wouldn't stay stable either. So they're trying to turn America as a whole into a nation of pigs. The gender is fluid. No, it's not. It's one or the other. But they're saying, no, you can make it anything you want and it can change on a daily basis. Well, that's a representative of a pig. It's double-minded. Proverbs 11.22, we saw that one already. As a jewel of gold and a swine snout, so, a, so is a fair woman without discretion. Now, here's a whole passage that deals with this same subject as uh, Matthew 7. It's 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2.22.
Um, and he's going to, in Second Peter chapter 2, he's going to talk about dogs and he's going to talk about pigs. Sometimes people will try to use this passage to say you can lose your salvation. But God never um, creates his children and refers to them as either a pig or a dog. Once you're saved, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. So these people were never saved to begin with, as we understand salvation. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The false prophet and false preachers or teachers are the animals God's identifying them as. And as an animal, they do default to their own nature. Animals have a nature. And that's how these false teachers will do the same as well. They have a nature. He explained to you what the nature was. They'll trample underfoot and they'll turn and rend you. So whatever your pearls are and whatever the holy things are, make sure you don't let these dogs and swine get a hold of them. Because they're not only going to destroy your holy things and your pearls, but they'll turn and destroy you as well, even though you gave them something. In Revelation 2.20, he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few th things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So, there's a woman prophetess, a woman preacher, and he says, um, that's Jezebel. <laughs> Got a high opinion of her, doesn't he? <laughs> and what they're teaching is um, false doctrine, something that's non-biblical. In Matthew 7, 6 again, he says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearl before swine, lest they trample them under feet, and turn again, and rend you. Jesus is saying it's wrong to take the people uh, that are dedicated to him, the people you've won to him, that you're supposed to be discipling. It's wrong to take those people and turn them over to a false teacher. Amen. That's, that's what he's teaching discernment. He's teaching judgment. He's teaching how to judge who you allow people to learn from. Um, as a matter of fact, it's wrong to take anything that belongs to God. If you've dedicated money to God, it's wrong to take that and give it to somebody who's not going to do something right with it. That's just as bad as taking a person that's moldable and doesn't know anything, rather than you discipling them and showing them what the Bible says, you turn them over to somebody who's going to teach them false doctrine. He says, you know what happens with that? When you turn somebody over to someone who teaches false doctrine, and they're going to learn something wrong from the Bible from that, the person you've turned them over to doesn't care about them. They're going to trample them underfoot. You know what's going to happen to you? Those same, that same person you turned them over to is going to turn around and rend you. He's going to come after you. Um, in Jude 1, we have to watch out because this is exactly what will happen the church is going to be uh, infiltrated by these type of animals. Paul said, um, I know that as soon as I leave, grievous wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. Jude 1 4, he says, well, There's only one chapter of Jude, so if you find Jude, just look for verse 4. <laughs> uh, right before Revelation. He said, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of ordained, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our uh, God into lasciviousness. What's that? 
um, something you can lust after. Um, no, that's not sexual. That's something you can want, desire, covet. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He said there's going to be people creeping into the church, turning everything into something that will benefit you. It, what's in it for me? I'm going to help you, you. That's why the gospel should not be preached as a social gospel. It's a spiritual gospel. Now, it has social repercussions. And um, you, you should be a good humanist, meaning the Bible says do good to all men. But even there, he says, there's a priority to it, especially them that are of the household of faith. Matthew 24, 10, he says, And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. That's the animals. <laughs> He's saying that's what happens to the nation of Israel. Before, before Jesus' coming, um, it's going to be everybody tattling on each other and turning each other in. That's what's going to happen. And you'll see pictures of it in the, in the church. In Galatians 5.15, he says, But if you bite and devour one another, that sounds like animals, Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. That's a church full of false teachers. They're biting and devouring each other. That's what he said that would happen in Matthew 7, 6. He said, they'll turn and rend you again. Well, they're biting and devouring each other. In Philippians three nineteen, he says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Christianity is not about anything on this earth. Anything that makes you happy or gives you comfort, that's not what God's here for. His purpose is not to help you have a better day. It's a better eternity. Now in the process, he will give you a better day. But if all you're looking for is a better day, you've not looked to God. You've looked to a mystic to give you something you want. Uh, in 2 Timothy 4.4, 4, Paul faced um, a false teacher. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. He said, this is how you handle these dogs and these swine. You just turn them over to God. And really, you don't have to confront them. You don't have to get involved in them. You just say, God, you, you know what he's done. You give him what he deserves. In uh, verse 15, he says, Of whom be thou where also. So watch out. Judge him. Um, For he hath greatly withstood our words. Paul was there teaching doctrine. And he said, he withstood our words. That's 2 Timothy 4.15. Um, in Revelation 17, uh, 17, verse 6. It says, And I saw the woman, this is talking about Mystery Babylon, the great whore. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. That's exactly what a false prophet does. A false teacher is going to come in and destroy Christians. They're not going to... Well, they may self-destruct and destroy their own as well. But their goal is something that is pure. They want to destroy something pure. Um, drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now that admiration doesn't mean he was, um, he was admiring her in a good sense. I mean, he was um, horror-stricken. Um, Matthew seven fifteen. He says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Do what? A vicious kind of dog. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, dogs in the Bible were not pets. We didn't, they didn't start becoming pets until 
um, just recently in history. Um, I think the stupid Germans came up with that. You blame it on the Germans. <laughs> they re-engineered Volkswagen to read that everything's just fine. They must have messed up. They must have been the ones that started this dogs or humans. <laughs> Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. So they're going to have some good things about them. Sheep's clothing is good. That's wool. Okay, The wool is still good. What's under it is not good. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. So a false teacher is not going to be noticed right away. You're going to have to know the Bible well enough to recognize what's a sheep and what's a wolf. That's what the whole passage is about, is judge. Make sure you're judging. When you hear something taught, judge it. Go home, research it. Find out what information there is on the subject in the totality of it. Not just one verse, not just two verses. Get the whole subject matter at hand and find out what God really has to say. All right, that's all I've got for tonight. Yes. Talking about swine. Mm-hmm. So when Jesus cast all the devils into the swine, mm -hmm. does that mean that women are more susceptible to evil spirits? Yes, I was going to put that in there, but I didn't want to open up a can of worms. <laughs> I didn't bring me. That's today. exactly. That's exactly it. Um, where's that passage? Um, it is. Um, the, the woman was deceived. The woman was in the transgression. The woman being in the transgression. Um, Who was when he was at, went to the Gadarenes? No, the, I'm, I'm talking about different. Uh, Matthew 8, 31. So um, the devils besought him, saying... Okay, passage, hold that passage, and I'm going to give you another one to find. Matthew 8, 31. Okay, 1 Timothy 2.14. Okay. Yeah, the, the maniac of Gadara there, the, um, no, that's not the maniac of Gadara. Anyway, those, those evil spirits want to go into the swine because that's an easy target because the swine is female. When in the Garden of Eden, of Eden, <laughs> of Eden, the Garden of Eden, the devil shows up not to Adam, to Eve. Second Timothy, where was our passage? Tell me, Second Timothy, two fourteen. First Timothy two fourteen. That's correct. Yeah, First Timothy two fourteen. First Timothy two fourteen. Yeah. It says, um, "Look at verse thirteen. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived." But the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. So a woman is easily deceived. That's why a female should always have a male connected. Um, when God names Adam and Eve, he calls their name Adam. They get his name. That's why a female always has a last name that's connected to a man. You get married, you take the man's name. If you're not married, you have your dad's name. That's not good for me either. No, it's the, you're missing the picture. It's not who the man is, it's that there is a man. It's a picture. It's not a, it's not a literal fact. It doesn't change anything. It's 
um, that you, there is someone connected authoritatively to you. Um, back up to verse 9. Um, in like manner, uh, let's go down to verse 11. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay, so this is where he's talking about um, Eve being deceived. They so said, look, if the woman is going to take the leadership role in a church or a, a gathering, um, of, with men present the devil is sure to get in there and deceive that's a prime target um, I'll give you another we're going to hit all the hard passages tonight um, look, look up um, she should be saved in, in uh, child that, that 15 Yes, okay, that's it. It's right there. Um, now look at this. Isn't this wild? He says um, that the woman was in the transgression. That is, she was deceived. Verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> That means the woman's most susceptible time to deception is in childbearing. Because there's more drain on your body, probably. More physical um, <clears throat> pressure than you're used to on a normal basis. That the devil knows you're preoccupied. So if there's a time to deceive you, that's the time he wants to do it. Now the salvation there is not eternal for your eternity. That's being saved from being deceived. See the verse right before it is talking about deception or not deception. So he so, says here's the way to keep them from being deceived in childbearing. Is that why a lot of women get extremely depressed after childbirth? I mean, yeah, really who knows? bad. He would know. Oh, the market yeah. deeply affected. Right. I'm going to, it says, right. notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing. So if she has children... I just explained it. What's the, saved, what's the saved in reference to? The verse right before it. Being deceived or not being deceived. Safe from being deceived. So if she has kids, she's going to be safe from being deceived. Mm -hmm. If. There's an if there. Keep reading. If they continue in faith. I see that. Okay. I'll have lots of kids. No. No. It, it's a warning. Even if you have children... He's telling you, I'm telling you up front, the time you're going to be most susceptible to deception is in childbearing. However, even in childbearing, you can be saved from the deception if you do these things. Continue in faith, uh, charity, and holiness with sobriety. Um, so that's a way out for the woman. Um, there was something else I was thinking, but I can't remember. Um, oh, yes. Let's go to the passage on um, um, 1 Corinthians 7, maybe? The, um, what are you looking for, baby? All the same if she be shorn. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> That's all what? 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 <laughs> Be shorn, okay. Verse 15. How you spell shorn? S O R N. It's talking about a woman. Mm hmm. Okay. Is it where it's a shame? Yeah. Uh, you talking about her hair? Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, first Corinthians 11. Okay, 
1 Corinthians 11, this whole passage deals with authority. The reasons for it and the structure. Verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to have his head, uh, ought not to cover his head. He's talking about when he's praying. For as much as he is in the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So he's saying, um, the man should be the direct conduit. Don't cover your head because he's going to be the direct conduit through which God is going to give guidance. The woman is going to be covered. Her head is covered, meaning it stops here. Nobody can give me any further information than my husband. Let's read the passage. He'll say it again. Um, verse 10. It says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. Why? Because of the angels. Because of supernatural beings. Because if you, she doesn't have power and authority that has to go, that the, the principalities have to go through before they can get to her, then she's easily deceived. That's why there's the thing about um, a woman having long hair. Um, Verse 13. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Okay. So he's here talking about authority, not something physically on your head or not on your head. He's talking about the man being the head of the woman. Okay, so he says there's an authority structure there. The job of the man is to get direct guidance from God. Why? Because it protects his wife. It gives her a level of protection she would not have otherwise had. And um, vice versa, if he's not getting God's guidance, he's opened the floodgate to deception. He's open. He should have been the guard. He should have been the authority standing at the door. And um, there should have been an authority that kept at bay some of that wickedness. And if he's not right with God, he's just opened that gate wide open. It's as if you didn't have a husband. Um, what is this about the woman not covered? Let her also be shorn. Yeah. Cut her hair all off? Where is that verse? Yeah. Cut your hair all off. The woman may not cover, let her also be shorn. Now, if she's not married or she's a yeah. widow, that's God that covers her, right? Correct. Correct. She's supposed to cut her hair off there, so let her be shorn. Yeah. They're talking about the physical hit. Mm -hmm. Um. They, they made a big deal, and the Amish and the Mennonites still do, that if a woman comes in, she has to have a head covering. Um, and they make a big deal about long hair. Uh, the Canaver, in fact, the Pentecostal are still that way. They don't ever want you to cut your hair if you're a woman. Um, well, why would they want her to cut her hair off? He's, <laughs> he's being sarcastic. Verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So he's giving you a complete authority structure. Uh, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Who's his head? Not the one on his shoulders. Christ. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Who's that? Her husband. Her husband. That's why she's not to teach or usurp authority over a man. Because she's taken an authority role that the man should have had. Uh, for it, for that is even all, uh, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. That is, it's all as though she had no authority at all if she's allowed to get up and take the authority over the man. Um, the great thing about um, a woman who's been saved for years and years and um, 
She's married to a man that's not saved, and then all of a sudden he gets saved. The great thing is something supernatural happens. God will jump in there and teach that man things the woman never saw in the Bible, even though she's been saved for years and years, because God wants to set up the authority. He wants to set that stru structure back the way it's supposed to be. He'll understand and see things that even though that woman has been doing everything she's supposed to, and she was saved, and she was getting things from God, that's good. But God is going to write the table so that the man gets the authority, if he's willing. Okay.